All right. Well, buckle up. This is a long story. We're going to talk about the BHR. That's the uh, LHD that caught on fire last summer. Was the victim of arson. A sailor burnt this ship down. This ship that had been going through two years of refit. Had all this new equipment. Billions of dollars spent. Uh, on on just the equipment and the refit alone, not just to mention the construction of the ship. And it is all gone. Well, the investigation from the Navy has been completed and made public. And Sam Legrone and Gidget Fuentes have written this incredible piece in USNI News about it. So full credit to Sam and Gidget. They did a great job. We're going to go over this. This is very long, so we may not read the whole thing. But I would encourage you guys, if you're interested in this story, go to USNI News and read it for yourself. But we are going to cover it here. All right. Long chain of failures left sailors unprepared to fight the USS BHR fire and investigation finds. And there we go. We got an injured sailor here. He doesn't even have a shirt on. And this guy's being carted off like people got hurt. Okay. From the piece, a cascade of failures from a junior enlisted sailor not recognizing a fire at the end of their duty watch to fundamental problems on how the U.S. Navy trains its sailors to fight fires in shipyards are responsible for the five-day blaze that cost the service of an amphibious warship, according to the investigation um, from July 2020 incident. Yeah, this happened over a year ago, last summer. All right, uh, Vice Admiral Scott Kahn uh, found that the two-year-long... Uh, $249 million maintenance period rendered the ship's crew unprepared to fight a fire. And the service says set by uh, crew members. So vice Admiral uh, Scott Kahn is the guy doing the investigation. He's the, the U S third fleet commander quote. Although the fire was started as an act of arson, the ship was lost due to its inability to extinguish the fire. Khan wrote in his investigation, uh, which was completed in April, the review of USNI news this week, Quote, in the 19 months uh, excluding the ship's maintenance availability, repeated failures allowed accumulation of significant risk in an inadequately prepared crew, which led to an ineffective fire response. And here's a picture of the ship on fire with the outline of where the ship, where the fire began down here in the lower vehicle bay or lower V is what we're going to be calling it here in a minute. Because remember, vehicles, you know, amphibious vehicles go in and out of this thing at sea, right? So all the way down here in the belly of the ship is where the arsonists sabotaged firefighting equipment and started the fire uh, on Sunday morning at like 7.30, a.m., right as the uh, duty section was turning over, which is a brilliant time to do it. The arsonist uh, knew what he was doing. He had planned it well. Uh, beyond this ship, Khan concluded that the training and the oversight failures throughout the fleet from Naval Sea Systems Command, U.S. Pacific Fleet, Naval uh, Surface Force Pacific Fleet, and several other commands contributed to the loss of the $2 billion warship. Oh, my God. I didn't realize it was $2 billion. Uh, that's so much money. Um, Khan singled out 36 individuals. This is part of the big thing. Five admirals who were responsible for the loss of ship uh, due to either their actions or inactions or lack of oversight leading up to the alleged arson. So the training and readiness of the ship's crew were deficient, says the report. They were unprepared to respond. Integration between the ship and supporting shore-based firefighting organizations was inadequate, wrote the Pacific Fleet Commander uh, Samuel Pamparo, on August 3rd, the endorsement of the investigation. Uh, there was an absence of effective oversight that should have been identified the, the accumulated risk and taken independent action to ensure readiness to fight the fire. Common to the failures evident in each of these broad categories was a lack of familiarity with the requirements and procedural noncompliance at all levels of the command. Everybody's guilty. From the highest admiral to the lowest seaman, nobody is without blame in this case just because it's arson isn't an excuse to lose the ship right the crew needs to be able to fight uh the fires and do damage control procedures and this crew was not trained apparently in any of that is, is what this is found so we're going to take a little bit a, a quick look at some of the people implicated in this uh the bhr fire accountability in this investigation vice admiral scott Kahn identified 36 individuals who contributed to the loss of the bhr lhd6 uh july 2nd 2020 u.s pacific command commander uh, admiral sam 
Pompero will now determine further punishments and accountability uh, actions for the loss of the ship. So these people are on the chopping block right now. Captain Gregory uh, Thoroman, who's the commander of USS BHR. Um, Captain uh, Michael Ray, who was the XO and the damage control training team leader he did not do his job because the crew was not trained of course he's not going to be the one hands-on training but he's responsible for making sure the training happens okay and command master chief uh jose hernandez his career's toast uh an unidentified chief engineer on board the richard and we're going to go through i'm gonna try and get their faces in here if i can maybe we can we'll do that okay I want you guys to see the faces of the people who are being uh, accused here. So basically the entire chain of command from the damage control assistants to the uh, senior watch officer, uh, an unide unidentified first lieutenant. Now I need to explain this. The first lieutenant is in charge of maintaining the ship in terms of rust and paint. And that's usually a senior enlisted man. For instance, if you want a first class petty officer to be selected to a chief petty officer next selection season, he would take, this assignment as a first lieutenant. Now that's kind of on board a submarine, uh, maybe on these bigger ships, that's a little bit higher rank because there's a lot more to it, but this could be a senior enlisted person, even though it has the word lieutenant in it. First lieutenant is not the same as a lieutenant. Um, let's see, LCPO said the leading chief petty officer for what, for engineering department. Interesting. I wonder if all, I wonder if the entire goat locker is implicated in this. Another unidentified sailor who was on duty. So if you were on duty on watch, uh, yeah, you do not depart the ship whenever it's on fire. Like apparently this guy did, uh, a senior enlisted member of the engineering department, uh, was on duty. So he's implicated. I want to get to the shock. Like, of course they're going to implicate all of these people that were on board the ship at the time. But now look at this. Look at this. Look at who else we're implicating. And as far as I know, this is the first time I've seen this happen. Keep in mind, I work for NAVC over the past year and a half, and I've never heard of this. But that's how serious they're taking this. The Southwest Regional Maintenance Center, Captain David Hart, former commanding officer. He wasn't even the captain at the time. Uh, they went and they got the old CO and they said, you're guilty, too. You know, you're going to have some punishment too. your career's over as well, even though he wasn't even attached to the command uh, because they have determined that these problems, lack of training and motivation and basically people not doing their job uh, began under his watch. So they went back in time on this. And this is the part that shocked me. They're implicating civilians. And uh, if they end up going to a military court, I don't know how they're going to be tried you know, because under the UCMJ, that applies to active duty people. But if they're going to be taking NAFC people to uh, a military court, I don't know how that's going to work out. Like lawyers are going to have to get involved in this if they decide to go that route. So other people implicated as 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 responsible for the loss of this ship are the uh, Environmental Safety and Health Department head of the Southwest Regional Maintenance Center. All these civilians, essentially, uh, unidentified waterfront operations department head. Um, yeah, I wish they had pictures because if we could see if they are in uniform, then we would know that they're, um, uh, freaking, you know, under the UCMJ and that would make this a lot easier. But these, these are often civilian positions. So unidentified code, uh, program manager for landing, uh, helicopter assault, LHA and that class Southwest regional center says he is responsible for the execution of maintenance and abilities of the LHD class ships to include oversight of, um, of preventive maintenance so this guy's in charge of preventive maintenance he's guilty too like everybody this is like the nuremberg trials everybody's getting shot yeah this is crazy this might even be a little bit of overreach but maybe the problems that uh cause the loss of the ship go this deep maybe all of these people are at fault so captain oh boy so commanding officer of naval san diego naval base san diego like the captain of the entire base he's been implicated um, federal fire Metro chief, Mary Anderson. Oh, that's the, uh, that's the base civilian fire chief. Okay. We're Admiral, uh, Betty Bolivar retired. Oh, because she was working at the Navy region. So 
yeah, this is my nightmare is that I'm associated with something that eventually goes spirals out of control. And then I get implicated in something like this. I kind of feel bad for her, but I don't know exactly what her, um, role is in this, uh, from the investigation, uh, concerning rear admiral retired, uh, Bolivar, uh, she is responsible for the satisfactory accomplishment of mission and duties assigned to the installation within the region. The execution of her duties contributed to the loss of the ship. Huh? Yeah. They're casting a wide net and everybody's going to jail. Look at this. Like everybody's going away. This is a massive decapitation of leadership in the Navy. Unidentified safety manager from Navy Regional Maintenance Center. That's probably another civilian. I'm not sure about that one. Uh, Naval Installations Command Fire and Emergency Services. And then finally, Captain Tony Rodriguez, Commander of Amphibious Squadron 5. Like the commander of the squadron. Holy shit. And then finally, Vice Admiral Rich Brown retired. Uh, commander Naval. Hold on. Naval Surface Forces Pacific Fleet. He's retired. Where'd he go? Here he is. Uh, as commander of Naval Surf Surface Force Pacific Fleet, he is responsible for the satisfactory accomplishment of the mission and duties to the ships assigned under his command. His failure in execution of his duties contributed to the loss of the ship. So they're going after people in retirement, too. They're like, nobody's safe. Oh, my God. Like, this is a head hunt. This is a head hunt. Okay. Uh, the Navy's pissed. And they should be. Two billion dollars. I don't care if it's arson or not. Put the damn fire out. You know? Khan highlighted the lack of adherence to Navy special procedures for fire safety, which the service put in place in 2012's arsonist fire resulted in the loss of attack submarine USS Miami SN uh, 755. We have a reactor division guy in chat from the Miami. Maybe he can add some to this in chat. Quote, the considerable similarities between the fire on the USS BHR LHD-6 and the USS Miami fire eight years apart are not the result of wrong lessons being identified in 2012. It is a result of failing to rigorously in implement the policy changes we designed to preclude reoccurrence. That's a fantastic statement from the rear admiral or vice admiral. Sorry, vice admiral. He's the investigator again. Navy officials said that a little publicity about the resulting investigation into the fire's cause and the firefighting response by the ship's watchstanders, the base federal fire department crews and local San Diego fire department. We're going to get to them in a second. The investigation describes the overall response on the first day as disjointed, portly coordinated and confusing. This piece goes into that. Uh, the revelation of this report after the Navy charged uh, BHR sailor, seaman apprentice Ryan uh, Sayer Mays with arson last July. Prosecutors say he set fire to the ship while his attorney says the Navy has little evidence to tie him to the crime. Uh, Mays Article 32 preliminary hearing. He's expected to be held on November 17th. We will be covering this trial. I'm letting you guys know now. So keep an eye on that date. Remember, November 17th, we'll be talking about him. He might be a scapegoat. He may be guilty as hell. I don't know, but he might also be a scapegoat. So we will we will not even speculate on that until we see the evidence of this uh, sailor's actions. OK, so this is a picture of the space or a drawing, I guess you will. Sorry, drawing. Um, this is where the fire began. And it's basically a staging area for equipment uh, on submarines. We do not allow this, but this huge ship is so big of course they're gonna have staging areas on board you're not going to be bringing on your forklifts and your planks and your fuel every time you need to do something whereas on the submarines we strictly enforce that if you bring it on board to work you take it off at the end of the day whenever whenever you leave you leave nothing on board submarines but that's not realistic on a ship that's as big as this one so they have these staging areas at different areas of the of the um uh of the ship and keep in mind these fire hoses which are like the red areas here those were sabotaged by the arsonist so that did complicate the response sabotage was a big part of this all right where do we want to pick up again like i said this is a very long piece we're not going to read it word for word but there's some very important facts that came out in this all right let's go through the timeline the fire began in the lower V space. That's the lower vehicle hangar, basically, which includes dozens of triwalls. Those are big cardboard containers. We call them triwalls because it's three layers of cardboard. And uh, they're as high as your waist, you know, about four by four feet. And you throw stuff in them. Highly flammable, too. <laughs> okay, triwalls filled with equipment, including uh, 
plywood, pallets, wire, spools, wood beams, CO2 bottles. Oh, the arsonist had ex extinguished or discharged the CO2 firefighting bottles. So when people got into the space and they picked up the CO2, there was nothing in it. Okay, they also have hand dollies, chairs, ammunition carts, but not ammunition. But they did have fuel and a forklift with gas in it and a cargo bay tractor there in the space where the fire began. The first hint of trouble, and this is where things can spiral out of control so fast. This is why if you're a junior sailor or if you're thinking about joining the Navy, you have to have the courage to raise your hand and say something's wrong. Because this is where it begins to go badly. The first hint of trouble on July 12th, 2020 came after joining after morning colors, rather just after 8 a.m. A junior sailor walked through the upper vehicle deck where she headed to a vending machine after her watch. OK, she noticed a hazy white fog uh, in the lower vehicle deck. So she's walking along this bay has is two stories high. She's in the upper story and looking down into the lower story and noticing this white fog. Say something. She didn't report it. The investigation found, uh, noting that because she did not smell smoke, the sailor continued to her birthing. Uh, around 115 to 138 sailors swapping duty on the ship that morning were uh, just a fraction of the 1,000 plus of the ship's company. So very few people on board compared to what's normally there. But she essentially walked by smoke and didn't say anything, which blows my mind. Um, around the time, another sailor who stopped at the side port door to the upper vehicle bay to chat with a sentry observed white smoke rising from the lower bay, which is right there. According to one report, one of them ran up the ramp through the hangar to reach the quarter deck. The quarter deck is where the brow connects the pier to the ship and people get on and off. Whenever they get onto board the ship, there's a watch stander there and that's called the quarter deck. Okay telling the officer of the deck about the smoke. They had just done colors. So the officer of the deck, the duty chief, the section leader, they're all on the quarter deck uh, saluting the flag, and that's why he knew that they would be there. At about 8.15 a.m., the engineering duty officer ran into a civilian contractor who told him uh, of smoke near the mess decks. The EDO, the engineering duty officer, went to investigate and meet another crew member. So Instead of investigating, like in the submarine force, the moment you are told of smoke or if you see smoke yourself, you get on what's called a 4MC. That's an emergency broadcast circuit that goes to very specific points in the ship where people are going to be, people in charge. That, and you say, you know, light smoke in lower vehicle bay or lower V. And then, you know, you sound some sort of alarm. Uh, the 4MCs, um, do they have the alarm? There's usually a collision alarm next to a 4MC. So you make the report, you hit the alarm, you make the report a second time. Because a lot of times when people hear the report the first time, they're like, what? They didn't catch all of it. That's why you say it twice. They did none of that. And this is basic boot camp stuff. This is where they teach you this. <sighs> Crew members who spoke to the investigation described some confusion in communicating among the watch teams as they scrambled to sort out the reports of smoke and get a solid picture and location of the growing blaze so they could organize and attack the fire. So now people are beginning to realize the significance of what's happening. Investigators found inconsistent statements from crew members about the actions to investigate the reports of smoke and fire alarms and why they delayed reporting the fire over the ship's intercom system, the 1MC. Uh, numerous sources agree to having heard a, a rapid ringing of the bell, but disagree on whether the casualty was announced as white smoke or black smoke or fire, as well as the location of the casualty as lower V, upper V or hangar bay. Um, I guess those are all different places. OK, here's a nice little drawing of the ship. So the hangar bay would be back here. But as you can see, it looks like it's a three story or a three level hangar bay. And then the vehicle bay, this is upper vehicle and this is lower vehicle. OK, so. It's not as open as I thought it was. So the lady who saw the smoke the first time was up here, but she saw smoke in this area, just white fog in her testimony, not smoke. And so, but she ignored it. Um, man. Okay, let's go back to the piece. Numerous sources uh, agree to having heard rapid ringing of the bell. Oh, I already read that one. Okay, here we go. At 0820, we're going through the timeline. Petty Officer of the Watch, that's the guy up on the quarter deck. Petty Officer of the Watch, I believe so. Uh, noted in his log, fire reported in lower V. Okay, so we have a log entry that says everybody's been informed. We know about this. We're logging it. Now we're reacting. So how far, how long did the fire burn? At least 20 minutes, probably more. Like she saw smoke sometime around 8 o'clock in the morning. So 
the watch turnover on a weekend is usually a little bit later in the morning than normal days. So they probably did watch turnover at 7 a.m., which means the um, arsonist could have set the fire any time around that turnover. So it could have burnt for as much as, you know, 30 to 45 minutes before it was even seen. Uh, that's unlikely, though, because it would have spread. But anyway, uh, it, it definitely went on way longer than it needed to before they began responding to it, is my point. Okay, I want to really get to the civilian response because the civilian response blows my mind. Okay, the duty fire marshal told investigators he received a report of smoke in Upper V and went to investigate. Then called the damage control central watch supervisor to tell the ship's company about the casualty after seeing smoke pouring out of Lower V. So now the fire is getting out of control. Okay, the OOD stated that the damage control central watch stander informed him that they already made a 1MC announcement, having not heard any announcement at 0820, the OD called away the casualty over the 1MC. So it is possible, especially in this maintenance period, where some of the MC boxes may not be operating. Um, there's supposed to be, the way this works in uh, shipyards is anytime they take down a communication circuit like 1MC or 4MC or whatever, they'll put in additional communication boxes at key locations where if there's a casualty, you go to that location, this temporary install basically, to, to make the announcement. It sounds like it's either not on board or nobody knows about it because everyone's trying to use the 1MC or the 4MC. Uh, either one would be the correct one to use. Uh, but apparently it's not being announced everywhere. That's adding to lots of the confusion. Keep in mind, sailors are getting dressed in civilian clothes, getting ready to go home, enjoy their Sunday. And some people are getting reports of a casualty and some people are still ignorant of it at this point. Okay, back to the piece. The 1MC called was the first time the ship's command duty officer who was in his stateroom learned of the fire. Huh. Well, who's the OOD? I thought he was on the quarterdeck. Okay, that's a little confusing to me. He reached the hangar where the crew was organizing initial suppression effort at 824. Okay, that's good. The CDO, the, the command duty officer, had texted the ship's commander and executive officer who were both at their residence, which would make sense normally on a Sunday morning. They would be home. About the reports of smoke, uh, the BHR commander, Captain Gregory Thoroman, received the text about the black smoke at 832 on his phone. Shortly before the senior enlisted sailor, the command master chief called to tell him that a few sailors suffered smoke inhalation. Oh, my gosh. So look at this. The command master chief is already, um, you know, looking out for his sailors. I don't know if he's on board or not, but uh, he's already saying, hey, we got some smoke inhalation problems. Tell him, tell him the captain and the XO that. Um, I kind of feel bad for the command master chief, but I don't know him. Maybe it was a toxic climate, but his actions so far are pretty good. Okay. 822 AM. The sound of the ship's bell could be heard from a nearby parking lot. Okay. So alarms are ringing now so loud that they're hearing it outside the ship. Minutes later, crews on board destroyers, USS Russell, USS Fitzgerald, which were also berthed at pier one reported black smoke coming from the BHR. Uh, both destroyers assembled their duty sections and began equipment rescue assistance or RA teams. That's fantastic. Those crews need to be recognized for doing that. Uh, the team of 11 Russell and eight from the Fitzgerald reached the hangar. So they went in with fire suits. Great. So these are trained sailors. They're, they're doing the right thing. Even though it's not their ship, they're going to help. But neither team was directed to join the firefighting attack because that's not being coordinated by anybody. Who's in D.C. Central right now? We need to find that out because D.C. Central is responsible for coordinating these fire teams. And apparently nobody's coordinating anything. At 8.25 a.m., a ship fire was reported uh, on the Anti-Terrorism Tactical Watch Officer, ATAU, a Harbor Defense Net Radio. In these early minutes, the sailors had no radio, so they used their own cell phones to communicate. The lead investigator found that the 1MC did not work in many areas, just like we thought. Okay, and there was a lack of urgency for some reason. Uh, when initial responders from the ship's force descended into the lower V, they might have been scared. I'll be honest with you. I've been in uh, low visibility situations where it is scary going into the engine room with your firefighting ensemble on and, um, you know, you're terrified for your life. Um, so I, I have a little sympathy for that, but they needed to respond anyway. Okay. No one shared the same understanding of what firefighter capability was online, uh, contributing to the failure to apply an agent onto the fire and set boundaries, which enabled smoke and heat to intensify. Yeah. These early inactions, are what really cost the ship, I think. 
It gets better, though. We're going to get to the San Diego Fire Department. Those guys are pieces of shit. Attack uh, teams have trouble finding services, firefighting stations. In fact, 187 of the ship's 216 fire stations, 87.5% uh, were inoperable equipment status condition at the time of the fire. Part of that was sabotage, but that's still a lot of fire stations down. Smoke and confusion. Uh, meanwhile, the small duty force on board uh, the BHR scrambled to assemble firefighting teams and to investigate the fire's location, despite thick, choking smoke spreading throughout the ship. Amid dangers of searing heat and possible fire flashes, some sailors, including chief petty officers, didn't don required firefighting equipment. They mistakenly believed that uh, by wearing their Type 3 Navy work uniform, uh, they couldn't wear the, um, the FFEs. I don't know why they would think that. That's weird. Okay, uh, the ship's fire teams were haphazardly outfitted and equipped with some self-containing breathing apparatuses and firefighting ensembles, but others without one or the other. So some people were, wear, were wearing the firefighting suit, but didn't have the firefighting bottle and mask. Some sailors had the bottle and mask, but no firefighting suit, which is useless because you're going to get burned terribly and be ineffective. So you got to put the uh, FFE on. Okay. Damage Control Central, DC Central. Watch supervisor stated that he, uh, he nor the engineering duty officer had any idea of how bad the fire was uh, until later events forced them to evacuate DC Central. Oh, that's inexcusable. So these guys are toast, whoever they are. Of that 36 we talked about, uh, the EDO and the engineering um, DC Central watch supervisor are, they're gone. At no point did either the D.C. Central Watch Supervisor or the EDO attempt to start any additional equipment or activate the uh, aqueous film fo forming foam, the AFFF, firefighting systems. So they could have flooded the area uh, with foam, essentially, that would have suppressed the flame. It doesn't make it any cooler, but it, it helps push the fire back, keep it from spreading, especially. AFFF is really important, especially if you have like an oil carbon based fire. That's what that's designed to put out. Anyway, despite the lack of reports from any announcements that were received or acted upon, neither the EDO nor the DC Central Watch Supervisor sought confirmation that their announcements were broadcast. So because of the problems with the 1MC, it's possible that they were making announcements that nobody heard or very few people heard. Uh, quote, though the senior EDO in the duty section, name redacted, did not hear any 1MC announcements from DC Central, he did not proceed to DC Central to determine whether the EDO was attempting to execute control of the firefighting efforts. So that's interesting. One of the MC circuits that's out is the one in DC Central. That's, that's why they didn't understand the gravity. They were not getting reports. They should have investigated why they weren't getting reports, though. Okay, anyway. Worse, the ship's installed AFFF systems weren't put into action, in part because maintenance was not properly performed. Oh, boy. Someone's going to captain's mass for that one. <laughs> and keep it ready. Uh, in part because the crew lacked familiarity and capability or, and availability. So they didn't know how to use it if it worked anyway. Everybody's at fault. There's no excuse for that. Like the people that need to operate it need to know. And if they don't know how to operate it, they need to learn. And they knew that they didn't know how to operate it. So it's not just like the senior leadership here. It's the junior sailors as well. Two crew members told Naval Criminal Investigative Service Investigations that, quote, they, sta they stated it was not possible to set boundaries in the lower V because it was such a large space. Additionally, they reported the fire spread too fast to set effective bound boundaries. That's possible. Uh, however, most duty section six sailors on board at this time stated in interviews that they neither knew how to set boundaries nor operate quick disconnects. Oh, man. Limited quick disconnect training was conducted early in the availability, but was not repeated or reemphasized. And remember, people are always coming and going on these commands. You get new sailors weekly, you know. OK, at, at 9 a.m., uh, two fire teams, including one from the Russell, were told to evacuate the hangar because smoke and they watched numerous BHR sailors evacuate the ship. It's funny how sailors from the Russells are still fighting the fire while BHR sailors are leaving. That's embarrassing. OK, at about 915. Uh, deteriorating smoke conditions in the hangar led to the command duty officer to order all personnel without SCBAs to evacuate the ship after he had consulted with the ship's captain. But the investigation found there were varying reports on whether this evacuation order was communicated over the broken 1MC. Sailors searching the birthing areas evacuated any stray crew. Thank God they did that. That's really important, including one sailor who collapsed in a passageway after spending 15 minutes searching while not wearing any emergency breathing apparatus. 
Uh, another sailor carried her, carried her to the hangar and where she regained consciousness and was evacuated for smoke inhalation. Okay. We're really trying to get to the civilians here, guys. Okay, here we go. Thoroughman, the ship's captain, reached the base at 9.05 and met with Federal Fire and San Diego Fire Chiefs at the incident. So at 9 o'clock, the San Diego Fire Department is on the scene. That's good. Okay, so one thumbs up for the San Diego Fire Department. They start off strong. The fire response already was substantial and a substantial fire alarm and subsequent fire alarm broadcast calls for additional help and calls for mutual aid prompted local fire departments to send crews to the base. Um, that's great. Now, the base will have its own fire department at well. That's that federal fire department right here. So you got three agencies. You got the ship's crew. You got the on-base fire department. And then you got San Diego Fire Department. <clears throat> we want to be very careful as to who we're about to uh, talk about because one of them fucked up. But, uh, okay, about an hour into the fire, no water or retardant had been laid on the fire yet, even though the federal fire crews had laid down their hoses and lines towards lower V, the fire had spread unabated for nearly two hours before the first firefighters, crews from the San Diego Fire Department, poured water on the flames. The people who are farthest away from the ship are the first people to fight the fire. So, again, thumbs up to San Diego Fire Department. Uh, they did the first two things right. They got there fast. They put, you know, wet stuff on the red stuff. That's what you got to do. That happened at 9.51 a.m. The upper vehicle deck where the city firefighters on their own initiative attacked the fire along the space's starboard side were unfamiliar with the ship's layout. So they could very easily get lost. They're really risking everything, these firefighters. Um, while unfamiliar with the ship's layout, they told investigators they nevertheless reached one area of the fire and fought the blaze for at least another 30 minutes before conditions deteriorated with the fire continuing a multi-fingered spread. So imagine if you're looking up at the ceiling and it's smoky, but in the smoke, you can see the fire going out in these little tendrils. And wherever the wind or ventilation is pushing the flame, they just spreads like, like, like little fingers out in those directions. It's terrifying. But when the billowing smoke had turned heavy and black, one city firefighter official told his team, this compartment's about to blast. His experience and knowledge saved lives of not just his fire team from San Diego Fire Department, but from whoever was remaining on the ship. Because at 1030, the on-scene commander ordered all firefighting teams evacuate the ship because it's about to explode. And at 1050, approximately 90 seconds after the last firefighters had departed the ship, a massive explosion occurred. So big credit to one city firefighting official. This man needs to be recognized. He saved a lot of lives right there. Okay, back to 1050. After the explosion, the ensuing shockwave knocked down people on the pier and blew debris onto the Fitzgerald, which was the destroyer uh, at the same pier as they were. A massive smoke billowed high into the clear San Diego sky. Uh, the report said sailors and firefighters, had, had they been on board, would have been killed. Uh, the delayed firefighting response in those initial crucial minutes for hours, despite the BHR crew's initial search for the city firefighting attack, team's attack further strengthened the, the fire's unchallenged spread towards 11 of the big deck amphibs 14 levels so within two hours the fire is on 11 levels that's insane um, flames ignite compressed air tanks gases and vapors ignite superheated fires uh, while airflow from vents through the passageways fueled the fires and spread up and down the trunks through damaged compartments it's a miracle nobody was killed in this I mean, let's keep that in mind. The explosion occurred for more than uh, occurred after more than two hours of efforts where none of the ship's installed firefighting systems were employed. That's amazing. Uh, no effective action was taken by any organization involved to the limit involved to limit the spread of smoke in the fires. The lead investigator wrote in his executive summary, when the ship was evacuated without personnel on board, available installed systems or electrical power, the fires of the BHR were unimpeded. Yeah. So like, for instance, at a minimum, they should have activated the AFFF system whenever they evacuated everybody before the explosion part. I'm talking about the initial evacuation, everybody not in SCBAs, whenever they made that call, activate, activate the AFFF, that way something on board is limiting the spread of the fire. And that's just standard common sense stuff, guys. This is not like you need special training for this. I imagine a lot of people, it's early in the morning, it's Sunday, they're a little bit in shock. 
but you need to get over that shit and fight the fire. I feel bad for the sailor. This guy's clearly not trained, scared to death, and he's going to go and fight the fire. Aviation bosun's mate, third class uh, Haley Craig from uh, Jacksonville, Indiana, prepares to combat the fire. And uh, I've seen those eyes before, and it's not good. Anyway, bureaucratic division hampering firefighting efforts, the investigation found. Okay, this is where we get into the problem with the integration between all the different teams. Uh, this is really what pissed me off. On the first day, the BHAR's fire teams of sailors did not integrate with the federal fire crews. We have training whenever we go to the shipyards. You meet uh, a representative from the federal fire crew on the shipyard or the naval base, and uh, whenever you go into availability like this, and there's a plan in place that whenever... Uh, initial response is the ship's crew's responsibility, which didn't happen here. But whenever the federal fire team shows up, they take over. You do what they say. Apparently that didn't happen. They showed up, but the federal fire crews really didn't take control of the scene. Okay. Ships around the waterfront began sending teams of sailors to help fight the fire, but the effort was unorganized, which is their fault. The federal firefighters fault. Uh, initial initially before the coordinated watch bill was established for five days, the ship and the federal fire worked uh, to separate command worked from separate command post on pier two without clear indication as to what the other team was doing. So they should have worked together uh, ships crew and the federal firefighters. They should have had one command post coordinating efforts to limit the further damage of the fire. I almost feel at this point, it's too late after 10 30, 10 50 after that explosion, it's almost too late. Okay, after San Diego's fire initial response and fire attack, fire crews did not re-enter the ship after it was evacuated. San Diego fire officials said they would support from the pier but would not re-enter the ship. Keep in mind, these are the civilian firefighters from the city, right? They're not trained in these special things. They're brave, but they're also, they have limitations. He says, citing that they're meant they have a they have a book right citing their manual that reads activities that pose a significant risk to firefighters shall only be taken when there is a potential to save lives well they've already evacuated everybody off the ship therefore san diego fire department's like well let it burn let it go and that's not right i don't care what the damn book says get in there and save this two billion dollar ship if you can like i said it may already be too late so this this policy is needs to be amended. And uh, that's really what spun me up about the San Diego Fire Department. They did do a lot of things right. And I need to acknowledge that they saved lives by recognizing the explosion was imminent. And uh, they got people off before people died. Kudos to fire department for doing that. But then they didn't go back on board and help. And pro this prompted frustration and disagreements with the federal fire and the Navy over the city's department safety policies. Uh, investigators noted after discussing it with the Expeditionary Strike Group 3 commander, the federal fire chief said that he told the San Diego Fire Department chief to leave if they were not going to provide meaningful assistance to the firefight. And they did. They packed up their hoses, they got on their trucks and they went back to the city. The notice, the noticeable departure of the San Diego Fire Department crews and the vehicles was followed by um, by that of other locals, localities who had responded for a mutual aid call. So not only did they lose the San Diego Fire Department, they lost everybody else that came to help. So now it's just the, the base fire chief and the CEO trying to coordinate this this effort who had responded with a mutual aid. OK, um, Uncertainty over whether the San Diego Fire Department was specifically released or left on their own led to confusion and disappointment among the BHR leadership. Well, you kicked them off the base. What did you expect them to do? Okay, they told them to leave and they left. I mean, both teams are at fault. San Diego should not have left, but they were told to leave, so... Okay, with the afternoon arrival of other ships, fire teams assisting more sailors joined the federal fire in chasing down uh, the fires as it spread throughout the afternoon. So they're going back in. They're going to try and limit the damage. By 6.30 p.m., everyone's exhausted. Uh, the fire was burning throughout the entire length of the ship with approximately three decks on fire, including equipment from the flight deck and the ship's superstructure, according to a report. By 6.55 p.m., the second explosion jolted the ship, causing multiple minor concussive and blast-type injuries, prompting a second evacuation that halted firefighting efforts uh, for several hours. And if at this point they haven't triggered the AFFF, everybody needs to get arrested because that's, uh, it's amazing. 
uh, I'm at a loss of words. The It originated from an 8-inch... Okay, so the origination of the fire, it says here, it originated from an 8-inch fuel jet propulsion JP-5, a fuel pipe located in the auxiliaries division compartment underneath the upper 5 ramp um, on the port side of the ship. Valve grinding in the area, 3812Q, uh, investigators found this explosion blew... Uh, the watertight door from the adjacent compartment uh, engine test area. Wow. So the explosion was so bad, it blew doors off hinges. And these aren't your simple doors at your house. These are heavy metal doors. A lot of them are watertight. Every one of them can be dogged in some way. And it just blew it off with a giant fireball. This is a really cool photo from one of the um, helicopters that were coming to assist, looking through its forward-looking infrared. And here you can see the superstructure, not on fire yet. But clearly you can see the hot spots in the deck. And so you can see the fire clearly originated here and it's spreading this way. Very cool photo. With the fire's continuous spread, the Navy's top concerns were failing the integrity of the ship's superstructure. Right, that metal's so hot, it's beginning to weaken under its own weight and it could collapse. And you don't want people in there when that happens because you're not getting them out. Okay, uh, the, the warping flight deck and collapse of the cavernous hangar bag, bay uh, that evening, in an agreement between uh, the Navy Southwest Regional Commander, the San Diego Mayor, San Diego Fire Department helicopters flew a mission to assist fire uh, impacts. So the fire department did come back with helicopters. At least they're helping again. Thermal imaging showed a 1,200 degree uh, fire is burning in the superstructure. A few hours later, the first two Seahawks, uh, Navy Seahawks began dropping salt water onto the ship as well. I should point out, and they haven't mentioned this yet, that a lot of the tugboats in the area were just doing everything they could to put water on the hull to try and keep temperatures down, even though that didn't really help with the firefighting. It just it helped keep the steel from uh, melting. Okay, by day two, the fire remained out of control in the ship's interior spaces as firefighting efforts expanded with a drone equipped with a thermal imaging helping to identify hotspots. By the third day, holes were cut into those spaces to enable uh, the deployment of AFFF, everybody. It's finally happening. Uh, the high-intensity fire pumps pumping equipment shot seawater into the uh, flight deck and the superstructure on day three. Communication problems between BHR and the federal fire continue to hamper firefighting response because remember for the first five days uh, The command and the base had two different firefighting command centers. They're still not working together here on day three uh, The report found that the crews battled stubborn fires and dispersing the office a uh, high heat delayed teams reaching joint intelligence center uh, the fire in in the debris filled troop washroom kept reigniting and that's a real problem too just because you put a fire out in a space on board a ship doesn't mean it stays out uh, you have to establish a fire watch basically on it until everything is cooled um, and, they, and they may not have had the ability to do that it's a huge ship right uh, meanwhile all all that water pouring into the ship required massive dewatering effort to offset the ship's list, uh, the ship driven by compartments filled with water. So that's true. All this firefighting water is not necessarily leaving the boat. It's going to make the boat more uh, heavy, you know, ballasting it down there by the pier. Uh, but at 1130, the uh, July 15th, firefighting waters were accumulated in the 01 and 02 levels. 01 and 02 are like the levels that are above the deck and all the other levels are below the deck. So if it's like an 01, 02, that's above the deck. Flight deck I'm talking about. Okay, shifted to significant uh, ship experience, rapid shift from uh, 2.1 degree to starboard to a 4.9 degree port list. So the water is collecting in the boat unevenly. And once you start getting a list, more and more water will continue going that direction. And you could eventually have a capsized situation. Uh, so according to the report, okay, that happened over a 90 second period. Uh, the firefighting teams on board uh, at the time were evacuated and the firefighting efforts halt again for two hours because of the sudden change in list. Apparently from two degrees to four degrees, almost a seven degree list change in 90 seconds. That would feel like the ship is rolling over on itself. That's why they evacuated everybody. Okay, uh, the next afternoon, day four, uh, ESG3 commander declared the fires were finally out. Wow. So that just kind of jumps to that, doesn't it? Apparently this massive um, influx of water and dewatering were enough to extinguish it. Okay, so here we go with the aftermath of this. Although the XOCO and CMC chief engineer and DCA were all present on the pier 
Prior to the explosion, uh, investigators continued they'd failed to establish co command and control of the situation and did not lead action to integrate uh, fire responders' efforts. Okay. Those guys are toast. Uh, the CO, even the CMC, whether he's a good leader or not, he, this is going to kill his career. Uh, instead of Commander... Oh, instead, Commander Expeditionary Strike Group 3, ESG-3, the ship's operational commander who uh, has no assigned role or responsibility in response to a shipboard fire during maintenance availability, stepped in to command and control uh, vacuum and align various ships, installations, and external organizations. Wow, that's really bad when your boss comes down to do your job during a casualty. Um, yeah, that's going to be a difficult and long discussion afterwards with him. Uh, after... After an evaluation of what it would cost to repair the ship, the Navy decided instead to scrap the BHR. In April, the ship was towed to Pier 2 through the Panama Canal to Texas, where the International Ship Breaking LTD took possession of the remains for $3.6 million. Pennies on the dollar. And the story goes on to compare this to uh, the Miami incident. I encourage you guys to go and uh, read it. This is just talk about a cascade of failures and the worst thing in the world an enlisted person can do is not be confident in your ability to fight a casualty and what builds that confidence training and drills and practical you know exercises don't be this guy i feel bad for the sailor i'm not making fun of him he's truly afraid because he's not trained and the people responsible for the sailor not being confident in his actions are these guys up here all the way at the top these 36 people these people here failed it's their responsibility to keep the crew trained and confident and able to do uh, damage control and they didn't and they need to pay they need to be um, well whatever they're gonna do there th this this report has been submitted for disciplinary action and I'm sure we will know what happens so yes the arsonist is a piece of crap if he's guilty he needs to pay the price for that but this let this be an example to all commands out there I don't care what country you're part of train your crew man because this could have been a relatively minor incident that maybe extended their shipyard availability a few months instead of losing the ship and while there was no direct involvement for these gentlemen here, they're responsible for the people who are and have a direct impact on saving the ship. So I have very little sympathy for these 36 names. I am a little shocked that there's civilians on there and that'll be interesting to see how they proceed with that. And, uh, you know, I may rethink my uh, contract agreement uh, next time I'm offered one. I may be like, nope, no thanks. <clears throat> Don't wanna be part of your investigation. And the sad thing is some people did get hurt. Oh, wow. <clears throat> okay. What do you guys think? I'm going to read some chat now and then we're going to move on. Uh, every year, uh, fire training at your company. Yeah, we did fire drills weekly, man. It was like Tuesdays and Thursdays. We did fire and flooding. It was, we drilled all the time. And I'll tell you what, when, when, when we had that real casualty that I told you guys about uh, multiple times where we had a real lube oil rupture in the engine room, I went in there. I knew what to do. I was scared. I, I was terrified, but at least I knew what I was supposed to do, you know, and that, that really gave me some comfort that I was around people who were submarine qualified, wearing dolphins. They knew the systems as well as I did. So if when things go horribly wrong, like they do, you can respond effectively. And this was an example of a failure from the top to the bottom. So it's not just the senior guys. The junior sailors are just as culpable in my opinion. 18 to 21 injured from the fire. Thank you, Bear Spirit, for looking that up. It's really sad when they didn't need to be. Sounds like uh, hangings are in order. Yeah, well, I mean, let's not go too far, but people need to be fired, okay? A lot of people need to go away. John Bloor says, huge tragedies like this happen usually through countless failures over long and short periods of time. And that's exactly what this piece points out is that over the two year period of them being in the shipyard, they never really reaffirmed or retrained on how to use this equipment, this firefighting equipment. Whatever systems goes down, you get temporary installs like I told you about. And they did have training on it once, like when they installed it. But you need to train on that stuff regularly, you know? Uh, Let's see. Black Sheep says this reminds me of the war game that went all wrong. 
over the summer. That was a failure of communication as well. Yeah, I missed that one. A uh, bear spirit says I say that sort of jokingly, but yeah, you're, you're, you're right. People need to be fired for this. And uh, listen, even if you're fired, um, maybe at the top level, like the CEO, he may not be able to recover. But if you're a senior enlisted sailor like I was, and a tragedy like something like this happens where it impacts your career, it's not the end of your career. Uh, the Navy has a good system for, for redemption. We joke that in order to make chief petty officer in the United States Navy, you must first fuck up and go to captain's mass and lose rank. <laughs> Once you've done that, you've checked the box for becoming a chief petty officer. So all is not lost for these sailors. They should not be discouraged, but they need to take from this experience and become better sailors. Train your crew. Bear Spirit says, but someone has to pay the price. That's absolutely us taxpayers. We're paying the price financially. It's a $2 billion ship. Uh, the people that are in the Navy and the Marine Corps, especially they're having to uh, use older equipment because they've lost one of their new newest, most updated ships. And uh, the Navy crews that crew the other LHDs now have to do additional sea duty because this ship isn't there to do it for them. This has rippling effects across the military. All right. I need to take a break. Uh, we're going to come back. We're going to do some more naval news, but I got to catch my breath and recenter myself because um, I'm a little pissed off. So we'll be right back. Give me a few minutes. <laughs> 